Okay, let's start. I can see that people are still joining, but uh, we can start. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, uh, Case Writing uh, Tips, the Do's and Don'ts, uh, which is a series of webinars that we've had for this year uh, competition, the Emerald AUC School of Business Case Writing Competition. So I'm just going to start with a few um, housekeeping tips. The uh, orange arrow opens and closes your control panel, which is on your right. You can change the audio option to control uh, to computer or phone. All attendees' microphones are muted. And this is a practical workshop, so you can free to send your questions and comments and share your experiences during the session, and we will be answering you towards the end of the webinar. The presentation will be recorded and will be shared on our social channels, and it will be sent as well um, in, um, in the post-webinar emails to all of the registrants. My name is Nadine Salah. I'm the marketing manager for MENA, uh, Pakistan and Turkey. And uh, today I would like to welcome our panelists, Inji Magdi and Shireen al Professor Virginia Bodulika, and Melissa Close. And this is our schedule for, for this uh, webinar. We'll start with a brief introduction and then uh, the talk by Inji Magdi and Shireen al And then we'll dig deep into the uh, case writing uh, techniques, tips, all the do's and don'ts by Professor Virginia Bodolika, and then a brief about the competition, and then we'll go through the Q&A. And now a brief introduction about the speakers. Inji Magdishi is the director of El Khazindar Business Research and Case Center, and Shireen is the senior specialist at the El Khazindar Business Research and Case Center. Uh, Dr. Virginia Bodolika, she's the Seti Khouri Chair of Leadership Studies and Professor at the School of Business Administration, University of Sharjah in the UAE. Melissa Close, she's the Case Commissioning Lead at Emerald Publishing. And now I'll give the floor to you, Inji. Uh, okay, hi everyone. Uh, it's now good afternoon from Cairo, Egypt. Um, we're honored to welcome you to this webinar that is launched in partnership with Emerald. This is part of the activities that we do uh, under the umbrella of the Emerald AUC School of Business Case Competition. Our whole aim is to support you in your case journey, be it case writing or case usage. Um, and our primary objective for this workshop is to support you in the case writing, and we hope that this helps you in submitting to our competition as we are encouraging submissions from our region. Um, and definitely no one can do it better than Dr. Virginia, so I don't want to take any further time from this uh, precious webinar, and I will just leave the floor to Dr. Virginia, and we're looking forward to hearing more from her. Yes, and we second that. So, Dr. Virginia, I'm giving the floor to you. Thank you very much, Nadine. Thank you very much, Angie, Shireen, and obviously Melissa for this beautiful and wonderful initiative that has been in progress since a long time. So we are looking forward really to have a very successful year in terms of submission to the case writing competition. So I'm here trying to share my screen with you and share this beautiful announcement about the Emerald AC School of Business case writing competition for 2022. Uh, you can see that uh, the marketing team from both Emerald and AUC and uh, Kazindar Business Research and Case Center have done an amazing job in terms of uh, advertisement, in terms of colors, but also I've noticed they highlighted very well that I'm going to be one of the <laughs> competition judges, right? So uh, I'm the most uh, actually appropriate and relevant person to talk about the competition and to give you some hints and advices about uh, how to do, what to do in order to be successful in this uh, round of uh, competition. Uh, 
So basically, there are a lot of things to be done. But the girls made sure to tell me that I have a limited amount of time because we would like to make it as interactive as possible. Um, we are back to some normalcy. Um, whatever you are in, in the world, I hope you have the opportunity to go back to face to face and to interact with people, particularly that our case method is so much more lively and dynamic if it is done in the classroom with physical interaction with people there where they can show the emotions where they can analyze the behavior of other people through not only uh, by reading the case but also even enacting some of the practices that are highlighted in those uh, amazingly well written case studies so we run this competition several times, of course, at AUC and uh, in collaboration with Emerald. And we do hope, and um, several, of course, um, stakeholders will highlight the deadlines and when and how you have to submit. I will be focusing more on this uh, part of, of the content related to how to write, what to do in order to be uh, successful in this competition. So the title is very appealing, case writing tips, do's and don'ts, uh, right? But at the same time, there are so many, so many aspects to consider when you do submit the case for competition and obviously later on for publication in the collection um, of the uh, emerging markets case studies, which is published by Emerald. Um, I do go through different techniques. Uh, but towards the end, I do still have uh, two slides where I do highlight in green color what it is that it is a do and in red color what it is that it's a don't or what are the do's and what are the don'ts, right? Kind of summary of all uh, uh, the webinar that we're going to have today in terms of content, in terms of what to do and what not to do, what not to avoid. I've been uh, on the editorial board of Emerald uh, Emerging Markets Case Studies Collection also since quite a long time. And I do, with the same type of, of case studies that are submitted for publication, I do have uh, uh, a kind of um, uh, very valuable advice to give because I do see common pitfalls or maybe common mistakes that happen from time to time with those submissions. And uh, with these final two slides in particular, I do highlight the most important aspects that are just the key requirements for you to enter in, that, in, in this competition. Right, And then after, of course, uh, it is a competitive world. We always say uh, we are living in a hyper-competitive dynamic world. And obviously, the stronger other cases are, the more competitive uh, the, uh, the whole process is. And sometimes small, tiny elements make a difference between a very strong case and a winning case. Right, So um, those are the aspects that will emerge also in the process of this webinar that I'm going to also highlight through a couple of slides that I prepared here. So one of the interesting things that I always like as I start talking about the case studies in general, um, I do like to convince the audience and the audience are faculty just like me and other people, practitioners, those can be students, doctoral students, master students, undergraduate students. Uh, I'm sure many of you who wrote case studies uh, involve uh, a lot of students on their team in order to even gather the data, tap into the most interesting uh, dilemmas that are worth solving and addressing in today's world. And uh, you do see that case studies do offer a huge opportunity for exploiting and even addressing a lot of skills that uh, many people on research teams have. So uh, according to what I um, have as a, as a perspective on these cases and then the skills, I do believe that writing pedagogical case studies, right? And that's uh, very important to, to, to understand that this is about pedagogy. This is about teaching, enhancing our value of learning in the classroom. So those are the real case studies that we are addressing here allow us to tap into 40 competences and those are 40 competences that are highlighted recently in a in a in an article from harvard business review one of the things that writing case studies uh, allow those people the writers the faculty whoever the person is to do is to 
explore really very innovative opportunities. And this type of competency is highlighted through the word trailblazing. So by writing pedagogical case studies, teaching case studies, everybody can really find new ways to use knowledge and expertise. Uh, there are many people who have the talent of writing and writing maybe in a, in a more engaging and artistic way, not to bore the audience, but rather to intrigue the audience about the dilemmas that the given company is facing, so that you can use that artistry of language in order to put these dilemmas in writing. So, Pedagogical case studies are amazing venues for the people who have this talent of writing, innovative writing, uh, to use this intricacy of the language to actually write those case studies in, studies in a way that uh, they are appealing and they are very interesting and they're obviously very relevant in the classroom. That's one. The second, tool making. Um, the case studies are very diverse and in, in, in a couple of slides there you're going to see that there are case studies that can be compact cases, there can be very long cases, there can be cases that are uh, more narrative, there can be cases which are based on using some digital techniques like uh, cartoon storybook cases where you it has the visuals and you represent the whole story in terms of some cartoons to enhance the understanding and empathy and the students' uh, capacity to put themselves in the shoes of the protagonist in order to be able to then act upon a given dilemma which is highlighted in that specific case. So tool making, the case in itself and the, the teaching note which is fundamental and has to be really the piece of information that is particularly addressed to the instructors using that, that specific case allows you to create a lot of tools actually. A lot of tools that you can even teaching note highlight as a tool that is a fundamental instrument or lever for application, right? So students take the content of the case and then using the tools that are presented in the teaching note, they can solve specific dilemma or propose some particular solutions to those dilemma. Or the case itself, in the way how you write it, you can create very innovative ways and techniques of presenting the story in a way that generates even some potential creations of the tools that that tool or model or concept can be used then in other classes or by other instructors. And now the T, it's translation. Translation, uh, how it is described as a, as a competency, is that the person who wrote the case study by developing that, that story in the case and also accompanying that case with a teaching note allows any interesting instructor throughout the world to use that case in his or her classroom through the teaching note which becomes such a valuable tool of support for all the instructors to be able to use a case which wasn't developed by them. But thanks to such an informative teaching note, they become really specialists at that. So who is translating that knowledge uh, from something that is very personal into something that can be shared is definitely the person who wrote the case study, right? So that is the translation where you can transfer your expertise through the teaching note to somebody else who can use the case study very successfully in the classroom. And then teamwork, why I highlight teamwork? Because really successful and from my experience, really the winning case studies and the most impactful, relevant case studies are the ones which are developed in teams. Because the whole idea is to create a complementary set of expertise and skills and competencies where somebody in the team who develops the case study is amazing to tap into the field work, to collect the data, to reach out to managers, to find intriguing dilemma and a topic that is a fundamental issue and that issue is worth solving, right? Somebody else on the team is amazing to summarize those ideas uh, through the interviews and then to highlight what can be the most important challenges from that story that is going to be written. Somebody else on the team can be an amazing writer, right? So put all this, is putting all this story in writing. It's not so easy. And that what also makes, of course, a difference between 
and just average case and a very successful case. So in teamwork, my personal experience tells that um, particularly in, in writing case studies, pedagogical case studies, you need several people with very complementary expertise. With that, what is fundamental in case two? So it, it approaches us to those do's and don'ts and techniques to pay attention to, to make sure that we make an impact. Obviously a lot of stakeholders and that's what makes the case and the competition so competitive and even hyper competitive because you have to please many people for your case to be like. So several stakeholders definitely. Writers ourselves. For me, for example, I cannot submit a case to a competition until I am not personally satisfied and proud of what I've done. So sometimes it really delays me and sometimes I can miss a deadline and that's really bad, but it happens. So I'm so meticulous with developing the story until I'm not fully happy with it, I'm not going to submit the case. So if there are several people on the team, imagine how much more difficult it becomes to produce the piece of writing which is satisfactory, but not only satisfactory, but even engaging and really, really relevant for other stakeholders to also like that. Instructors who are going to use your case in their own classes. Of course, students, not to forget, those are the most important stakeholders to whom we address that. What about the people who share their perspective uh, with us and we collect those data to write about, about their stories, protagonists, right? Those are important. We do want, of course, to publish our cases, right? And particularly the EEMCS, is a Scopus uh, uh, ranked journal. So it's very uh, competitive too to publish at the end of the day the, 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 the case in this collection. Reviewers are the people who uh, hopefully give us constructive feedback. If not, this is editorial's job to always uh, channel the feedback into the really um, constructive set of comments rather than destructive because the whole purpose is really to provide developmental comments so that the case can always evolve towards a better piece of writing but also an impactful solution to problems that are being highlighted in the case. Judges, we are talking about the competition in particular, so judges are also human beings and they might have some preference in terms of what is most impactful right now, what is most uh, most uh, uh, challenging right now, given the, the context, given the situation, given what is going on in the world. So the topic has to be really impactful and has to be timely, right, of the case in itself. And of course peers, because we're talking about competition, so we've just said uh, we do compete against each other in this competition and the more intriguing, the more timely, the more developmental um, the, the, the case is, the more likely it is that the case is going to win the competition. And believe me, the satisfaction that you get from winning the competition is really, really huge. So with that, two things that I know that most of you know, but it's fundamental because sometimes people either over or under emphasize one of the two crucially important elements which go hand in hand. I cannot stop emphasizing this. It is equally important to pay attention to the case as much as it is to pay attention to the teaching norm. I, for instance, did win in the past different case writing competition and there were cases and situations where judges in their recognition of the different uh, um, awards that were given uh, were highlighting, uh, for instance, the two documents are very strong, but one in particular which really made um, the difference between being an average and then a successful case in the, in the competition was the teaching note. So what I most commonly see from the experience being on the editorial board of several uh, pedag uh, pedagogy driven obviously case studies um, is that um, most submissions do emphasize the case, do develop the case, but then teaching note really stays behind. It's much, much delayed in terms of uh, timeliness, but also in terms of content that has to really accompany all the different elements uh, which are presented in the case study. Sometimes you do have a lot of information in the case, 
but then the teaching note in itself has a couple of pages and where through the analysis which is presented which is very superficial most of the information from the case is not being used so then why there is so much information in the case which is not then um, used in the teaching note in order to be able to provide some valuable sample answers to the questions which are related to the case so it's fundamental that the two elements go hand in hand, that one is not detached from the, from the other, they are together. And if you put a piece of information in the case study, make sure that it is valuable to address the questions that are being asked on this case. Otherwise, it will just increase the length of the case without actually bringing or generating any value. So it's very important to combine those two and definitely if they go hand in hand and there is this iterative process between the two so we make sure what we write in one is valuable for the other and what we write in the teaching note is actually uh, withdrawn or taken from the case itself. Unless uh, there are also teaching notes where um, instructors can choose to say um, go and search the web for the recent information on a specific industry and then compare with the data that were um, represented in the case study with the recent data. So that's a situation when um, the, the students are invited to search beyond uh, what is written in the case study. But this is quite rare. So it's very important that those two documents go hand in hand and then of course if they are, if all those do's and don'ts are really respected and implemented, uh, there is a very high likelihood of having a, a strong publishable case study and a case study that can win a competition. So what is uh, important and then that those are key elements here uh, and those are aligned with those don'ts uh, sometimes where I say it's very important to know that a teaching case study is not a qualitative research driven case study. So we don't have the literature review. We commonly see a section in the, and even I've seen that in the past, where there is a case study, you start with some description and then there is literature review. You don't even have a section which is called literature review and pedagogical case study, right? So the teaching case study should not be treated as a qualitative research driven piece of writing. No, pedagogy is the essence of a teaching case study. And obviously its content and the way how it is written is different than a scientific qualitative case study, right? In the way how it is written, it should not really point to one solution or to a preference. The writer has to always stay neutral never be judgmental, never drive the reader uh, and give the impression that the writer has a preference and makes a judgment about this or that. So always the writing, and again, if we go back to these do's, uh, which will appear at the end in a couple of slides, you will see that the do's have to be uh, a lot focused on the way how you do that. And that's a really, a technique of, of writing. How do you present the information in a way that you stay neutral, but at the, at the same time, you hook the reader, uh, right? And you attract attention and they are interested to read till the end to see how the story um, develops. What is the culmination point? What is that key challenge there that needs to be addressed? Uh, obviously, uh, the, 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 the information which is presented there um, has to be selected based on the questions that are going to be then highlighted in the teaching notes. Uh, always a decision maker, who in this case is going to be the student who receives those questions and try to propose some solutions, would like to have more information. But in reality, even though we are rational individuals, we are bounded in our rationality by the amount of information that we possess. So that's why we have to be very selective, not to have extremely long case study, which is then overwhelming the reader, and then the reader and the student is um, lost in that amount of information that then cannot be usefully um, employed in order to address the three, four, five questions that are being asked. Now, 
what kind of cases do exist? And here I'll go through that rapidly, just for you to understand what is more preferred when you write a case and when you also receive that case for judgment and competition or for publication or as a student even. Uh, disregarding the variety of stakeholders which are involved in a case study, there is a commonality in terms of preference of the type of cases that are really liked across different regions of the world and among different stakeholders who are involved in a pedagogical case study. Success stories or failures? You would be surprised, but of course failures. Failures in what sense? It doesn't mean the company failed totally, but where there is a problem, there is a dilemma, there is something that is really urgent to be solved. So the sense of urgency always intrigues people and the reader, and they jump in to, to, to really put themselves in the shoes of protagonists and solve those issues, um, which uh, challenge the reader to take actions, or which just uh, say, oh, how beautiful the story of the company is. Obviously, with challenges. Those are the cases which are more pro provocative. Um, the ones which are really based on secondary sources of information only? No, because we can read that very easily in newspapers, in, in other publicly available sources. The idea of the case studies uh, is that you tap into the source of information which is not easily available. That's how you make uh, the difference between the media, the people uh, who already published uh, in uh, publicly available data sources a piece of information. You tap into the subjective world of protagonists by gathering information through interviews, through the qualitative techniques that you then use in order to be able to write a very intriguing case study. Right? Um, is it about the events that happened 30, 40 years ago or timely? right here, right now, so that it calls for action. Obviously timely. Uh, something which reports things like, like in a history of one, two, three, or rather writes it in a very intriguing way and narrates a story. Narratives are preferred. Stories rather than histories with data and just dates and this happened then, this happened then. It's too boring and even people who read will not retain that. The more intriguing the story is, the more narration is being used, the more interesting the case becomes and the more hooked the reader becomes. Which are long or short? Well, here we, we, we do have, that's why the collection also has the, the tendency to differentiate between compact cases, short cases, cases which are divided. A, B, C, D in one competition, for instance, uh, uh, where I developed a um, story of a family business uh, over several generations, I decided to divide it in four different stages. And each of the stage was related to a different dilemma. One was a family dilemma, the other one was uh, industry dilemma because the company wanted to diversify over time. And then uh, the next one was the dilemma of um, uh, ownership and the last dilemma was uh, the dilemma of succession because already several generations came on board and there were uh, critical issues to be resolved. So here it's a long case but by fracturing it in pieces uh, you make it more condensed and at the same time you intrigue very much the reader to understand what happened after the first um, period of existence of the company, how that dilemma was solved. And only when the discussions, then you go with the second stage, with the second piece related to the previous story. And then you go to with the third. So that's another technique where you can divide your cases in A, B, C, D in several, so fracture it, so that you still can, in each of those uh, type of um, divisions, you can highlight a specific dilemma. Uh, which provides sufficient information? Yes, we still prefer to have the information written in the case so that we avoid to go in search and search and search in order to be able to solve the, the questions uh, suggested on the case. On companies that we can identify with or artificial fictitious? Of course not. We want identifiable company, not fictitious company, because then it creates just a fiction rather than reality and detaches people from something that is uh, the, the real world. Uh, 
related to post material. We remember that this is a pedag pedagogy, learning, teaching. So obviously it has to be embedded in a specific course to highlight a specific material, which describe or duplicate in format schools. Obviously uh, describe the situation. And in some, this is also a technique of writing, uh, use verbatim the quotes from the interviews that were done with the protagonists of the case and which are pro provocative challenging or not of course provocation challenge dilemmas problems are always more intriguing and those are the cases which are liked so look in those two slides here a set of pages of slides you can see that already you have a lot of do's and don'ts right because this is the summary and the reflection of really the preferences that all the stakeholders have in terms of what type of cases we would are more likely to be successful and are more liked and more impactful obviously right so great cases capture and i like to repeat it and repeat and still there are many if they fall short because there is something that is missing and I know that, like I just highlighted the competencies that we have when we write case studies, the same thing I would like to highlight for the great cases which capture something essential. Typically, I refer to them either as six Ps or five plus one Ps, because that additional six one is the one which is dependent very much on the judge, if we talk about the competition or judges. Uh, or if we talk about publication of this successful case, uh, it depends very much on the editor. So we'll see that last P, which is also fundamental in uh, the decision of whether a case should be winning or should be published or not. So really, a case study cannot not succeed if it is focused on the following five plus one P. Uh, as we've seen before, the problems-driven uh, cases are very light, are very impactful. So if you write a case on problems, issues, dilemmas, and those problems which focus on really great, impactful, timely, uh, right here, right now happening uh, in, the, in, the, in the world, and challenges that managers have today uh, in, in, in today's corporate world, to animate the debate and to make sure that people, students, stakeholders can act upon, definitely it's already one step towards winning. So problem-driven cases are by far uh, the most interesting and the most liked and the most impactful. That's one of the pieces. The second, do not forget to write the subjective world of people the protagonists who are the ones living and experiencing the problem within the corporation. So make that protagonist speak in the case. How do you make? You make the voice of those protagonists be heard through the case study. How? Well, you use the quotes from the discussion. You create the, the, the dialogues between the people. You describe the emotion without saying this is good or bad. Let the reader decide this is good or bad or it's neutral. At the end of the day, it's not to put a qualifier good or bad. At the end of the day, it's to so what? To act upon, to solve, to put ourselves in the shoes of those protagonists. So it's very important to make the voices of those protagonists be heard. So the people who are solving the issue put themselves in that protagonist skin and imagine if I were to be there, what I would have done. Pieces, intriguing situations, interesting stories, dilemmas that happen in particular or specific environments. Look, if you look at the story of the winning case studies, right, in different competitions, there is always something, something which is very timely. So if we are saying there is a huge, for instance, uh, unfortunate natural disaster that happened, and there is an, a, an amazing example of how a company could solve um, the, the issue of this natural disaster through an amazing response management or crisis management. So that definitely would attract attention because it happens, it's very timely, it is right now, it is impactful. 
In some countries, as opposed to others, for instance, we do not have the same access to basic sanitation or some, uh, let's say, some layers of the population do not have access to education or to very basic uh, healthcare services. And particularly, we can even address a specific topic to a specific layer of population like young girls and young women with particular needs that they have. And then the company which comes up with very innovative solution to address that specific need. So again, it becomes very timely, very unique, and it's something which is happening within a specific country in a specific context, which is not really relevant in other contexts, but it, it is so important for other people in other countries to understand the specificity of the dilemma in other countries. Why? It develops compassion, it develops understanding, it develops or prevents, develops a lot of tendency to find political solutions to problem rather than military solutions to problem that might exist. So pieces are very important to be highlighted through the contextual evidence being presented on the case. What is fundamental too? Remember I always said when you write that's the do that you make in the case, the tip. Um, make sure that you don't take a stance. You do not defend one against another. There are different characters in the case and those protagonists, they all have the right to exist. They all have the right to have their opinions. So let the readers decide what is the best combination of solutions that can come up from this situation. It is fundamental not, remember that the majority, that's what the case study, uh, is having in terms of contribution as opposed to exercise. An exercise typically it's more like a calculation thing which leads towards one single good right um, um, solution. In the case study developmental, the one problem driven case study, what is interesting that you never have one right, absolute right, correct solution to that issue, dilemma that exists. No. There are several possibilities to solve the issue being presented in the case study. And that is my sensor, I'm sorry. I hope uh, you still see me. If not, just focus on, on the slide. So if the light sensor and it went down, I have to jump literally to, to put it on. So possibilities. Make sure that the writing is done in a way that um, definitely the reader does not have an impression that you have a bias towards one solution. There might be a lot of plausible, correct, applicable solution to the problem highlighted in the case. Paradigm, paradigm is a situation where we refer to the embeddedness of the case study in the course that is being taught. So we have a course, and that course has a lot of models, concepts, theories, and students typically, particularly our, our undergraduate and even MBA audience, master level audience, right? They do prefer practical, applicable stories where the theories that uh, we describe in, the, in our lectures sometimes are devoid from meaning because they don't see exactly how it is being applied, how or, or the theories is applied in practice. They always see theories being detached from practice and no matter how much we say it is, it is actually extracted from practice, they don't see that. So paradigms are fundamental in, in, the, in, the, in the writing of your case to keep in mind the paradigm, meaning the theories, the concepts, the models that we would like to reinforce through the case that we are um, presenting to our audience, right? And you will see that paradigm are fundamental, particularly for the writing of the teaching notes. And you see here we have five P's, the problem, protagonist, pieces, possibilities, paradigms, and the sixth one that I mentioned depends very much on the judges for the competition or on the editor, meaning that even, and I've seen in my judging of several competition, uh, competitions that we had, I've seen cases which were far away from being publishable in the way how they were submitted. Uh, but I did see, and this is the sixth P, it was potential. So there are cases which have amazing story, or there are cases which are written in an amazing way, but the, the problem is not clear, or it's not 
put in the forefront of the case, which should be the case, for it to be an impactful case and a case which is a winning case. But at the way how it was submitted, the case study, it is not there. So either one or another aspect is missing, but there is a potential because there is something impactful, there is a story, there is timeliness, there is really this problem that is worth solving. So with some assistance, constructive feedback from reviewers, from the editor, from associate editor, from judges, this case can be really elevated to the highest level possible and then being published in the collection eventually also uh, because of this potential uh, winning uh, uh, a place in, in the competition. So this is the six P that I always highlight and I say this is the value I would say particularly of, of reviewers who really provide um, constructive feedback to elevate the case to the publishable standard. Now, what I do see one of the problems that is most common in the case, because case goes hand in hand together with the teaching note, I highlighted that and I would like to reiterate. So, and that this specific uh, uh, buckle that you see, it's iterative process in the content of the case itself. Remember the most liked and the most impactful are cases which are challenging, which are uh, presenting a dilemma, which are pushing the reader to put themselves in that particular situation and be under the pressure of urgency to solve the issue. So fundamental thing to hook the reader right from the very beginning is something that we call opening paragraph in the case study. Typically, not typically, but I would say 99.9% .9 that opening paragraph is without any heading. You don't put it as introduction. You have no heading. You start with one, two paragraphs maximum to highlight that story. The story of whom, what happens. And typically in those one, two paragraphs, you do mention the place where the situation occurs, the situation, the problem, the issue, the dilemma, the person who is that, right? And the company where this happens. So all these will rapidly go right away by mentioning the person, the context, the situation, and a summary of this intriguing way to present the problem in the case. And that's the key focus of the entire case. Those opening paragraphs, one, two, maximum short three paragraphs, are fundamental to make your, your reader continue reading your case. And then you go to the core of the case. It can be sometimes some parts are dry, particularly if you present the background of the, of the, of the company, of protagonists, uh, a little bit of sto uh, history behind that, yes. But then you come back to the story. What is the challenge? What is the problem you describe? So that at the end of the case, where is the closure? You come back to that specific problem that you highlighted in the first place when you started writing uh, your case study, right? So that is fundamental. So you see that cyclicality, starting from the process, then focusing on the problem, the whole story, and ending from uh, the, the case study with that focus of the problem again. So you, you conclude that circle uh, from the beginning with the problem, the core, and then again, the problem at the end. Right? So you see, you walk the reader through the whole situation to arrive to that specific closure, right? Because obviously when you start with the focus on dilemma problem, people understand the problem, but they don't know where it comes from. How did it develop? How the company did arrive to that? And that is the core of the, of the case itself. Um, another aspect of this is to understand which of the pieces that I presented before are really appearing in different sections and parts of the case study. You will see that the focus, uh, which is about the critical issue, problem, dilemma, you will see that the P of the problems is the critical one to be appearing at the beginning of the case. And then you can very easily use your artistry of highlighting the other piece. For instance, the P of the pieces. I like the story, uh, the context, the situation, all this is going to be described in the, the, the middle of the case, right? So this is the pieces. There you'll describe more in details also your protagonists, right? The people who are 
who are really the, the key uh, essential uh, individuals who are leaving the problem uh, in the first place, right? And then you would also, towards the end, by keeping a neutral stance, you would also, uh, in the way how you write, you would also open it up to a possibility, endless possibility of, of finding some possible solutions, never pointing to just one. So again, this is the way how you do that. Instead of saying there was only one option, this. So it's not worth even to, to write a case study if you point to only one solution, right? The case is about multiple possibilities and that's why people discuss them to be able to then pre-select some and then even prioritize some of these possibilities. And then at the end, the focus again, you highlight the problem again, the one that you started with at the very beginning. So I've seen also through this, the, the past uh, competition that I judged in the editorial board, um, there is a detachment between the problem that is highlighted in the beginning and the problem that uh, concludes the case. There are two different problems, right? And that's not, not consistent. We are still in the same case. We are still in the same story. So we have to conclude with the same very problem that you started the opening paragraph with, right? What is important to also know that there is one P that you will never explicitly highlight in the case, but you will talk about it in your teaching notes, which is fundamental. I've seen many times the causes of rejection or of weak cases. It's not the case. But the weakest link, as we know this metaphor of the weakest link, is the teaching note, right? So very important not to underestimate the importance of the teaching note in terms of obviously having a very strong and solid case study. So you have a couple of criteria here which summarize, I just put them here, I would skip to go more to those uh, uh, key advices for the do's and don'ts. Uh, in the teaching note, given that it's a document which is uh, going hands in hands with the case study, it's very important that we do have sections that have to be included. I've seen, again, from the past iterations in judging and in the editorial boards, um, literally the teaching note has uh, synopsis and then maybe two, three questions and not even very well developed simple answers to that and the teaching note ended. It is fundamental to have all those sections that you see here on the screen. Yes, there is synopsis. Yes, the case is teaching case. So we need to position that within a given course, within a given level, undergraduate, graduate, and even PhD. There are cases even for that. And when it is used, after which chapter, after which type of material that you are covering in, in a specific course. Fundamental to highlight the learning objectives. We still do not have learning objectives in many situations which are aligned with the level of sophistication of the course. There are sometimes um, cases written for master audience, but the learning objective is uh, like understand. First of all, learning objective of understand is not a good one because you cannot measure the understanding. You have rather to say application to something or development or creation through the verbs that I'll, I'll present to you just in a second as a summary. So learning objectives have to be sufficiently complex or aligned with the level of audience. The, um, if we are talking about the undergraduate uh, audience, obviously the learning objectives are going to be less sophisticated, less difficult. Now, if you are talking about more elevated graduate audience, obviously it's going to be more sophisticated, more application type of uh, learning objective, more creation, more solving and or providing innovative solutions, right? Um, maybe still uh, ignore to put a, a section on methods of data collection and analysis. It is not a qualitative research driven article. It is a case study, pedagogical too. But in the teaching note, we do say that this is a real case study, realistic on a real company, not fictitious one. And this is how we have gathered the data using this and that at that time with those people in so many iterations and so many sequences, right? And how we analyze the data so that we 
wrote a case study. So it's very important. Uh, detailed teaching plan with teaching board, fundamental. Theories, many do really lack on theories, models that are to be reinforced in this specific type of um, case study, right? So this has to be written very clearly in the teaching notes. Suggested readings for case usage. What kind of material you would use in order to be able to successfully solve and prepare the case study? List of discussion questions. And then, fundamentally important, the sample answers for those. Many do ignore, say, oh, we can ask the students and that's it. No, no, no. You have to really provide a very detailed sample answer. And of course, there are techniques to do that in a very successful way. And what students really appreciate is epilogue, meaning what exactly? Because by the time that the case is published, uh, maybe one or two years elapsed. And when you bring the case in the, in the, in the class, um, already in the reality is more updated. So bringing that situation to life in the case study that is being discussed in the class, but also in the class itself and saying, well, in reality, that's what uh, the, the, the protagonists have decided to do. That was the, the, their solution. But only after the students already analyzed that. So it's very important to include the epilogue in the teaching note too, uh, in order to actually uh, give um, an update on what really happened afterwards, after the case uh, um, uh, data on the case were collected. Let me, given for the concern of time, let me go to the tips uh, right away so that we can summarize in a very um, important way the key, uh, the key do's and don'ts. Uh, maybe I will go to this uh, here and then I'll have those slides on do's and don'ts to conclude my topic of discussion and then to allow sufficient time for Q, Q and A's, question and answers. And it's gonna be my pleasure to really answer what is more pressing for you. What is the element that you would like me to highlight more in details and give advice. I can't really stop um, telling how important it is the writing style. The professional writing style, which is not casual, at the same time, it's not using very heavy scientific terminology. Right? So it's a, that what makes it engaging, relevant, practice oriented, but at the same time, it's not just casual piece of writing. It is still supposed to be professional. It's important to have a structure in the case, section, subsection, not a messy kind of thing where you have five, six, seven pages without headings, subheadings, and it becomes a little bit complex to follow the story and to follow the different events that unfolded over time in the case being described, right? So it's very important to have a logic in the structure. Sometimes even shuffling the sections and changing the places makes the case much more compelling and strong. So it's important. Flow of ideas, again, going back to the sections of section, but the overall organization of the case is very important. So how you structure and how you allow the reader to follow the development of that case story is also fundamental. Consistency, don't contradict. Sometimes there are contradictions there, not because protagonists have contradiction, but in the way how you present the story itself. You say one thing and then you end up doing another thing and this really confuses the reader. So it's very important to follow that. Yes, it's very important, the grammar, the sentences. Uh, I've seen many times, particularly if uh, this is the case of non-native speakers, uh, the collection does uh, publish sometimes in special issues in, in, in other languages like French and Spanish, we've done that. But given that we talk about the, the competition that we would like uh, to encourage you to submit your cases to competition first and then uh, automatically all your submissions will be considered for publication in the, um, in the collection. Obviously, it doesn't mean that it will go directly, it will go through peer review again and it will go through back and forth the editors and the reviewers and everything, but uh, it is very important that uh, the case is written in a professional language without those mistakes and the problems uh, of grammar and uh, sentence length. Sometimes sentences are long, five, six, seven lines, right, uh, long. So it's very important to, to make it easy to follow at the same time in a way that it is still written in a professional uh, language. Don't underestimate the importance. Remember I said tool making? 
Sometimes a piece of information can be conveyed in the form of a table, of a chart, of a graph, rather than writing two, three, four pages. If you can shrink it down and put it in a visually enhanced way so that you don't occupy, occupy a lot of space in the case and you just present that in form of, a, of an appendix or a graph or a chart, that is really valuable too, right? Good. With this, I would like to go into, apart these writing techniques, I would like to go into these very important tips that um, are fundamental, particularly when you submit, because you will submit to the competition and then it will go into the submission system for the, for the journal to be considered for publication. So there is one, uh, several advices I would like to give you because it comes from the experience that I've noticed the most common mistakes. So first, it's very important, check the submission requirements. The website is really informative and tells. There should be four different documents submitted. And I think in the previous slide, uh, I do mention these four. The case study, the teaching note, right, two documents, the title page, there is a template, and there is consent to publish or release form that allows um, the, the, the competition uh, judges to consider the case for the competition and also the publication process when uh, the case is submitted for publication. It's very important that there is a release form which allows uh, the authors to release the story of that company and for it to be published in publicly available uh, spaces, right? So that's very important. There are four of those documents that you have to submit, right? So going back to that, uh, the key advices that I have, and then I'll conclude with do's and don'ts. Check the submission requirements and make sure that you submit all that is required. Because if one of those is missing already, you don't stand a fair chance to really run fairly through the process of this competition, right? And to win uh, the competition or to have a quite a solid outcome out of this competition. Two, advice is always, please do follow the submission requirements to the letter, right? Meaning if there is this what is required, uh, typically the editorial assistants, when they receive the submission before sending to anyone, they do check. Uh, this, 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 are the submission requirements satisfied? Because the competition always have a deadline, so we cannot go uh, beyond right a specific deadline. And if you submit um, just the, the day of the deadline, the editorial assistant will check that only after the deadline because it was last minute submission. And there is no way to send it back. If you submit to the journal, the editorial assistant can do uh, this uh, type of analysis. Uh, look at the submission criteria, look at something that you've done, and then something that is missing, then they'll send back to the author and say, this is missing, so resubmit again. But in terms of competition, if you do the last minute submission, there is no way to do that. So you, you will lose your opportunity to go through that competition. Formatting your, your files. I've seen so many times, and I've seen also the judges being irritated, the reviewers being irritated, saying, oh, this should have not reached our table for review because it is very messy. This is formatted this way. One is putting uh, character letter size character. One is using Times New Roman. That one is in the same document, right? Uh, it's, it's really presented in a way that is really making the reviewers get nervous and we are not interested to do that, right? So it's very important to pay attention to detail. Quality of the language, as I said before, paying attention to detail and organizing the file under the, the specific heading. And of course, another thing, I very commonly see the following mistake. Um, the authors, and this compromises the entire process and what happens that you don't run uh, uh, through the competition. You don't stand a fair chance to be judged because it compromises the uh, anonymous peer review process, right? Where the author's name should not be revealed to the reviewers. And vice versa, authors don't know who are the people who review their cases. So I've seen many times authors do remember to take away their names from the case but they forget to take away their names from the teaching note. So the teaching note is still starting with, this teaching note was developed by, and there are all these authors they presented. So please be careful, do not do this mistake, okay? And 
Let me conclude with this famous, I promise, I'm gonna do this, the writing tips for the case studies. What are the greens to follow, meaning the do's, and what are the reds to avoid, meaning the don'ts. So the do's, what are the key things? Please, 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 fundamental, engaging writing style, not to bore the reader. The first cases which are most commonly rejected or not liked are the ones which are really very technical with no writing technique of engagement, of style, of narrative, of using some buzzwords, of using some quotes, quotes from, from the protagonist, some um, very attractive, impactful uh, situations, right? Um, dialogues. It's very important. This is very important. That's how you keep the reader interested. Catchy, really, catchy titles, catchy topics, intriguing situation, timely and topical. As we discussed about that already, decision-driven case studies are very liked, meaning where there is a problem and that problem needs to be solved. What are the possibilities to solve? Endless. Very huge advice and very important. Try to pretest your case with the audience, meaning the students, before you submit for competition. Why? Students are amazing giving you feedback. When they read, they say, oh, I didn't understand that. Oh, this was developed insufficiently. Oh, this is not really enough. Oh, so you have the opportunity to really elevate your case to the publishable and to a successful level. Connection between case and teaching notes, which I highlighted before, fundamental. Don't underestimate the value and the importance of teaching note. I had in my personal experience winning competition because of such an amazing, outstanding teaching note I had. Even if the case was maybe not as significant as others, but the note was so impactful and so detailed and so clear how to, how to use, how to enhance the learning of students in the classroom, that this is uh, even worth it sometimes of, of a winning place. And dilemma, what is that? Don't forget, which I highlighted for the case, that you always have to start with the problem, right before the case, and end up with exactly the same problem, right? That dilemma which appears at the beginning and at the end. What about the don'ts? So what are the things not to do, <laughs> right? So basically I try to to just convert many of the things by saying do not. Sometimes we remember better what we do not have to do. So like that, we make sure that we write a very impactful case. It is surprising, but I do still have so many situations receiving the case in competition, in the, the collection, that cases are written in present tense and sometimes in future. So it is never, 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 there is only one tense being used, it is past tense. So never use present tense in case writing. Even the future is in the past because by the time the case is there in the hands of someone, it is already a past story because it takes time for you to write it. And already the story in the hands of somebody else who is reading it is a past story. So it's past. Everything is past. Even when you talk about a country, it's a past. Even when you talk about the industry, it is a past. Even that industry exists, but it's a past configuration of that industry. One year ago, two years ago, three, uh, two months ago, right? So do not use present, future tense in case writing. The most common I see it's present instead of past. Do not write your case as a research article. Remember, we don't have headings like literature reviews. We do not have literature reviews. We can use the secondary data of information to support something that we want to write in the case, but we don't do a typical literature review and we write with methodology and all this in the case itself. No. So don't do this uh, mistake that I do see quite commonly in, in uh, teaching case studies. Do not use exclusively secondary data. Actually, the most liked are the ones driven by primary data. It doesn't mean that we don't use secondary, but if you use only secondary data, it's much more difficult to make an impact. It's possible, but much more difficult compared to the cases which use a very fruitful blend of mostly primary sources of data and with some additional secondary data. Do not use outdated material concepts, cases on situations that occurred 10, 15, 20 years ago, even five years ago, pre-pandemic, the reality already now is different. 
so that uh, it doesn't really make an impact. People like to solve issues they can identify with, that they are still relevant and still timely. Do not ignore the importance of the teaching note. I again highlighted here through the negation of do not forget, right? Because the teaching note is fundamental element that accompanies the case. Do not write fictitious case studies. By the way, the collection itself does not publish fictitious case studies. Second, we do, all of us, like to identify with the protagonist, identify with the company, understand what company is that, that this is real, that this is a problem that is worth really solving. And that's exactly here to conclude when we select something we do select something which is impactful. So focus on the dilemmas, problems, and issues which are really worth solving, right? Do not focus on something which is trivial, not important, and not impactful. With this, I would like to conclude with something that I believe is gonna stimulate all of us in terms of uh, improving our skills in writing. One day I was in, in MIT and I really noticed something which was posted on the door of MIT lab where they were talking about that common dilemma between theory and practice. So the first sentence uh, uh, sounded like that. Theory is when you know everything but nothing works. The second was about practice. Practice is when everything works but no one knows why. And in that lab at MIT, they were saying that this is in this lab where theory and practice come together. And the last sentence, nothing works and no one knows why. Obviously, they were self-critical and obviously it was a little bit sarcastic way to say. I do believe that at least with some practical advice that you heard today in this webinar, I hope that now everything will work and everyone will know why. I really wish you lots of success with your submission to the competition first. I'm looking forward to read your intriguing cases and I'm looking forward to see who are going to be the first top three uh, winning cases in this year's competition. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to provide any answers that might support you in winning the competition and in publishing your case in our collection. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Virginia, very, very much for your presentation. Uh, like we always say, we can always see uh, passion and um, hard work in your presentations. I personally have learned a lot. I did not know the cases needs to be in the past. So that's that's a new for me. <laughs> yeah, so it's, quite, it's quite interesting. Um, but thank you again very much. And um, uh, just to give a bit of a background of why we're doing this competition, and it's to encourage uh, researchers to submit cases for the emerging markets, which is mainly in the Middle East, because they will then be in a way recycled to be used in, in the teaching methods, in the modern teaching methods. And it provides a huge exposure for those emerging markets uh, globally and around the world. So besides winning the, the competition and winning the funds and getting published in the EMCS is a, is a huge reward that I just wanted to, to highlight the contribution to the research community and to the, to the modern teaching um, methods, is, it's, it's amazing. So we encourage everyone attending to please submit your case and um, use uh, Professor Virginia's notes into your, um, into your cases. And now we're moving to um, Melissa Close. I'm leaving the, the, the mic to you. Thank you very much. Um, and just to reiterate, thank you so much, Virginia, for that really informative and I think motivational presentation. Um, I'm just going to speak for a few minutes to share some resources that you can take away um, once you move into the independent um, writing portion for your case. Uh, hopefully, I'm in the process of sharing my screen. Um, are you able to see this? Yes. Perfect. 
Um, so first off, I just wanted to mention a bit more about the Emerging Markets Case Studies Collection, um, which will be the host publication for this case rating competition. Um, so Virginia mentioned this collection a few times during your presentation, but just to reiterate, um, we publish discussion-based teaching case studies um, that deal with real-world challenges and dilemmas in the classroom environment. Um, so. The important term there is real world um, because we do not publish fictional cases. Um, we want them to be, you know, examples from real businesses that students can really sink their fingers into um, to explore and develop these decision making skills that they'll use later on in the workplace. Um, in terms of what we accept, we accept cases from all business and management disciplines. Um, so those are welcome in the competition. Uh, we accept compact cases and longer form cases as well. Um, and everything must include that very important teaching note um, that was covered in the presentation. Um, we do accept submissions year round to the collection. Um, there are some relevant submission deadlines associated with this particular competition that I'll share on a future slide. Um, and we do host a couple of other competitions each year as well. Um, and if you are interested in learning more about EMCS or getting involved as a reviewer, um, please do feel free to reach out to me at my email that I've included on this slide. Um, and now the promised resources that I mentioned. Um, so I think it's really helpful for, for webinars to kind of get those gears turning um, and get you really motivated and inspired on your chosen topic. Um, once you move on to the independent writing portion of your case study, there are still some resources that you can turn to that Emerald provides to help you if you know you have any questions that come to mind or you or find that you're getting stuck in one particular portion of the writing process. Um, so the first resource I would mention is the Cases Learning Hub. Um, this is a completely free online platform that anyone around the world can register for. And it is very valuable because it provides an end-to-end -end overview of the writing process from the beginning, where you identify that need, where you want to address in your case study, all the way through to evaluating your case study and hopefully going on to get published. Um, and as you explore, this kind of course in the Learning Hub. Um, you'll find interactive infographics, um, videos from our editors, and everything is really helpfully go at your own pace and track your progress um, as you complete different um, sections of each individual module. Um, so it is very helpful if you are particularly new to the case writing process to have those guidelines written out for you very clearly um, and you can follow that step-by-step -step process to get you to the end goal of getting published. Um, some things that are also available on the hub that I would mention in addition to kind of the core writing module um, are some other resources such as the teaching with a case study module um, so if you are looking to become more confident in you know, facilitating classroom discussion, um, maybe teaching case studies online, if you're in a virtual environment, um, that module can be very helpful just to build up those skills a little bit more so you can feel um, kind of very much competent and confident to use cases in your classroom. Um, we also have a learning with case studies module, which can be used for students to conduct um, a more thorough preparation in advance of classroom discussion. Um, so it, with this, you can assign it along any case you are reading in class. They can take notes as they're going through. And at the end of that module, they'll have the option to um, export those notes that they've taken, such as identifying you know, the dilemma, um, the challenges and whatnot, and take that as a PDF to class um, that they can use when you are discussing it as a group. Um, and then finally, there is a useful resources section that will share things such as past webinars we've completed, also sample cases, which are incredibly useful to see examples of other past award-winning cases um, where you can compare, you know, how did the author tackle, you know, the teaching note or, or covering this section of a case can be quite helpful as you're working on your own. Um, and then just a couple of quick links to those key things that Virginia mentioned. Um, so first, you know, a guide to writing teaches, teaching cases, which we have available on the EMCF author guidelines, and also writing that teaching note as well. So it does have um, the list of, you know, what we expect and how you can go about preparing that. And then finally, the EMCS author guidelines themselves, which are very important to review before you submit. Um, and make sure that you've covered everything we require so you can move on to the actual judging portion of the competition. 
Um, if you are working on a compact case, we also have a book available from Emerald, um, which is the Compact Guide to Compact Cases, which is written by an editor of our other case journal. Um, this provides some annotated examples, um, helpful checklists, roadmaps, et cetera, for writing this short form of cases, because um, it can be challenging to write in this very concise format. Uh, so having checklists to help you out can really make a difference and and having a quality, you know, very good case study at the end of the process. And then finally, these are just the dates for the AUC School of Business and Emerald Case Competition. Um, so we are currently open for submissions. Um, our submission deadline is November 30th of this year. We hope to see many of you participate in the competition. Um, to do so, please just look at EMCS's um, Scholar One platform where you can start a new submission. Um, and then we are looking to announce the winners in January of 2023 as the judging process will take um, some time. Um, there is an award pool available for the top three cases. I've listed the relevant funds there. Um, and by entering into this process, um, you will automatically be considered for publication in the MCS. Um, so even if you are not one of the top three cases, you still have a great opportunity to go on and get published. Um, and I believe that is all for my portion. Um, so I'm going to hopefully stop sharing my screen now um, and we can move on to some of the questions from the chat. So if you do have any questions, please do enter them in and then Virginia can go through and answer what you're yeah. looking to know about the case writing method. Yeah, we actually have a couple of uh, questions, so let's hope that we can cover them all. So the first one is, can the case or notes include the actual solution the company adopted? Definitely. So um, not the case. So in the case, remember that the case is all driven uh, by the dilemma and the issue that you present to the readers. In this case, our most important stakeholders, the students. In the case, you do not uh, write about the actual solution that the company has taken. However, in the teaching note, yes. And you can present this either as one of the possible solutions to the issue, but most importantly, given that this is the real solution that was taken or uh, whatever kind of option that was taken by the company in real life, you write it typically at the end. Remember I showed in the slides, the very, very end was called epilogue. And in the epilogue, typically, some people also refer to it as what happened in reality. And then in that final two, three, four paragraphs, you describe the real solution that was in real life implemented by the company. Because as we said, the case is already passed when we, we, we end up publishing it. And then maybe one, two or three years already elapsed from the moment when you gather the information about the case. However, you have a knowledge about what happens in reality. So you write that. That's what the company did. They did this and planned it, and the result was this, if you possess that knowledge. Typically, it's very, uh, very intriguing for the students to know what exactly, what kind of, of path to solution the company embraced. And uh, the hugest compliment I personally get in a in, in a classroom when I when I use my own cases and this is the, the absolute pleasure to use your own cases because you know the case from A to Z. You started from collecting the data up till writing it and publishing it. So the most uh, intriguing and the most I would say it's a compliment uh, from the students if they really get so engaged to solve the, the proposed solution to the dilemma highlighted in the case and then after that professor professor but what what in reality happened do you know what happened so they are so intrigued by that situation that they say but what the company did but what they managed but did they end up doing this and what was so if they ask you this it means that they really the case hooked their attention so much that they really want to know what exactly happened it happens mostly in cases when you have a very challenging situation and you have because of that to protect the identity of the company uh, attention it's not a fictitious case it's a real case but just because the dilemmas are so sensitive to the protagonist that you are allowed to disguise the case what does it mean you don't really say the real name of the company and the real names of the protagonist to just protect their their identity 
but at the same time you do describe the real situation so i do have in some of those these guys cases students approach and say professor this is that company right that, that. I'm like, no i'm not going to tell you i signed the confidentiality agreement i'm not going to tell you the real name of the company but if they're so hooked it means that you've done an amazing job writing the piece. so yes now yeah, say yes great. you write it it's Attempt. All right. Uh, the other question: What do you consider to be the word limit of a case study, and can a case study include different objectives related to different theories, for example, marketing and innovation in a case? And how should information from primary resources uh, sources be integrated into a case? Discussions, comments through the protagonist within the case. Okay. Very good. So one advice. First, uh, I'll start from the end. One advice, how these primary sources can be integrated and all this. The best advice is always to read the examples of prior winning case studies. So you can see exactly that artists, because it's in theory, it's easy to put those slides that I presented today and then to say you should do this and this. In theory, we all know that. But then it comes to the practice and to start writing it. How do you succeed? obviously with experience. You feel that with the, from the first case to the second to the third, you become better. So experience, it's important. Second, you learn from others, you learn from the peers. So take those cases, the announcements from the previous year's uh, winners, we do have them, they are published, most of those cases are already published in the, in, the, in the journal. You can refer to this journal, download those cases, read those cases, and you're gonna see how this is accomplished in practice. Typically, uh, the, the primary sources of information are very important to address the, the P of pieces and the P of protagonists, meaning that you're going to write about the protagonist through their own perspective, because that's the information that you gather through the interviews, right? When you, are, you go to see the protagonists, you, you ask them and they, what they felt and the emotions and this, and this will pass through the writing of the case. The secondary sources of information are very important to give the background about the industry. You will not waste the time of the protagonist who is going to explain you the industry is like that. There are so many competitions, there are this and that. And the US, you want to take maximum from the protagonist to discuss about things that are not collect, easily collectible or available in the, in the secondary sources. You'd rather tell about why exactly they were challenged in this, what were the intriguing dynamics within the company that you cannot really know as an outsider because it's all protected within the company. So that's uh, secondary sources of information are very valuable to provide background about the competitors, about the industry, about the country that you can very easily gather from the secondary sources, right? Um, so that is the way you, you put a lot of um, emphasis on that primary sources to highlight the context, the situation, the intrigues, through the lenses of the protagonists in the case. Now, uh, learning objectives. Typically, uh, because the question was, uh, can we have several learning objectives rela related to several courses and then uh, uh, make them all together in one? Typical advice always is, but then the, the, this is the ideal world, that a case should be written with one specific course in mind. It's very difficult to achieve different learning objectives for different courses, completely different courses. Marketing with the theories there, and then innovation with completely different sets of theories, and then supply chain completely different. Typically, the advice is to have maximum one or two different courses in which this case can be used. Typically, for instance, we can have a strategy course uh, and then in strategy, we have a, a session on ethics. And then we have an entire course of ethics. So yes, successfully you can use this case in that session or chapter when you tackle ethical issues, the strategic dile dilemmas, but through ethical lens, and in an ethics-driven class, which the entire uh, course is about ethics. So yes, and here, like we see there, is, there are commonality, we're still in, in ethics and in different stakeholders and like that, we define about and this is also very important sometimes we receive a case which highlights four or oh, sorry not four uh, seven eight nine learning objectives this is not realistic this is impossible and the best advice is to have three to five and five is already stretched different learning objectives right so advice 
maximum two courses in which you can use this case. Identify the theoretical frameworks, models, concepts through which you are going to analyze this case or the case reinforces, right? And then link the learning objectives, which should be at maximum five, but that's already a stretch, related to the content of that specific course or chapter session that you would like to reinforce through a case. And I think I'm, I'm missing, there is first part of the question. So two parts I addressed, but there is, I'm missing something else. What I'm, um, um, Nadine, there is something the, else. The that word, yeah, the word limit for, for oh, the case. Exactly, thank you, thank you. It was a very comprehensive question. With yeah. five so sorry, I forgot. Work. Um, so uh, Melissa also highlighted, I did say that, but Melissa made it more explicit. We do have compact cases. Typically, I wouldn't advise you to submit compact case to the competition because we already judge from different perspectives and it's going to be very difficult to make a, a winning case with a compact case. Compact case is typically having not more than 1,500 words in total. Can you imagine? You can have then appendices, charts, uh, table and all this, but as a write-up of it is not more than 1,500. Uh, works. So I wouldn't advise to submit it for competition yet. It can be published, of course. Right now, for the competition, normal length case. Typically, it's around. Uh, if we were to say double spaced, it can be 20 pages double spaced, which converts into about 7,000 words. Right. So you see, it's almost five times longer than a compact case. So that's average. It can be lower, it can be more, but way more than this it's not advised it becomes too heavy to read people lose interest and it's already losing its momentum right when it is too long um and too short then it's uh, it's good but it's a different category it's compact cases so on average six five thousand words to seven eight thousand words in total so that's more or less the length word length of a of a good solid case study and winning case study too All right, that's perfect. Uh, I'm afraid that's uh, that's the, the time that we have now. There are a couple of other questions that we will not get the time to cover, uh, but we can cover uh, separately. Um, like we mentioned, the recorded session for the webinar would be sent to all the registrants one day after the webinar with, a, with the automated certificate of attendance. Again, one day after the webinar. Um, we will run a, a poll now for like a, for one minute, which has a couple of questions for you to answer. Um, but I would like to thank uh, Professor Virginia for this magnificent presentation, in-depth and detailed one, and I hope that the audience have had the benefit uh, to use um, this presentation. You can thank now you. see you can now see the poll. Thank you very much. My light was dimmed again <laughs> because I had to sit a long time. I'm very dynamic, so here I had to sit. <laughs> so yeah, I noticed. My, yeah, but then, it, but then it went up. It went up back again. Yeah, no, because I, I stood up. I, <laughs> I, I took advantage that you were talking, so I stood up uh, closer to the sensor. Right. So yeah. sorry. We we have some dynamic. I'll have to stand up again. Okay. Yes, the answer to this question should be yes. Will you take part in the competition? <laughs> yes. I'm seeing some no's, which is uh, odd. Which is actually oh. a question that I hope I hope the attendants now can can actually answer. It, is what do you think is stopping you from submitting your case and participating in the competition? As we're we're providing support for throughout these webinars, so let us know in the in the question section what it is that you think is stopping you from participating in the competition and um, yeah, submitting your case. Getting this amazing recognition, apart the fact that uh, that you contribute to a dynamic society of case writers throughout the world. Yeah.
be uh, now that we're back to normal <laughs> like more writing yeah. hands on doing it correcting it on practice right so that um we really convert that theory into practice and show how to do that did you participate in 21 competition So do you generate Nadine uh, at the end? Do you generate the, uh, yeah. the results of this? Yes. Okay. Just to get, it helps us um, with upcoming webinars and to just have a better yeah. insight about the competition and, and all. Yes. So now with the final question, which I'm assuming and I'm hoping that everyone will say yes. <laughs> <laughs> We could see actually in the in the in the questions um, some very very good feedback from Idel Saria saying very useful presentation thank you others asking thank. to receive the presentation after um, after the webinar but this is to conclude the poll section so thank you everyone for attending and uh, we hope that you that you would submit your case and you get a chance to win a spot and have a chance to submit your case in the Scopus ranked EMCS. Thank you everyone. Thank you for our AUC partners, Inji and Shireen. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you again, Professor Virginia. Thank you everyone for attending. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Good luck. Bye. Good luck. Good luck. Bye. To everyone.